All right. So today we'll uh, we'll talk about monads from the perspective of a programmer, uh, a Haskell programmer. So today we'll graduate to be like full-blown Haskell programmers. So you you've learned everything and now monads and you'll finally be able to write hello world at the end of this. <laughs> it's a natural progression in Haskell. You start with higher order um, functions that are polymorphic and you end up with hello world. Um, so, uh, monads in Haskell. Haskell is famous or infamous for introducing monads into programming. Now other languages are picking it up because they were so useful. Um, monads solve this very important problem in, in functional programming. Uh, as, as, as you have seen, functional programming is all about pure functions, pure total functions. Can everything be expressed using pure total functions? There was a doubt about this because like in other languages people use, um, f they call it functions, uh, let's call this computations, okay? Let's call it computations that have side effects, okay? He said, so how do you express a computation with side effects in uh, using pure functions? One of the simplest side effects, well, I don't know if it's a side effect or it's like one of the uh, computations that are not really expressible as total functions are partial functions or partial computations, right? Computations that are not defined for every value of their argument. They have some domain, right? <laughs> for some values in this domain, they are not well defined. And as you've seen several times, we've we kept repeating this, there is this maybe monad, maybe functor, or maybe data type that can be used for this purpose. So if you, have, if you have a computation that is partial, you can replace it or represent it in Haskell using a pure function, total function, that returns a maybe. Right? So you'll have some, some kind of function that takes an A and returns a maybe B. And what it does is when the computation, the partial computation behind it, uh, is undefined, it will return nothing. And if it's defined and produces a value, then you will encapsulate this value using the just uh, constructor. Okay? So, so now uh, we are done, right? So we have. Like, if, if there is a partial computation, we'll just use the maybe. Uh, the, the problem is that we want to be able to decompose things into smaller pieces, right? Not that just have a one gigantic function that returns a maybe. We want to split it into smaller functions, maybe, all of them representing some partial computations. So we want to be able to compose things like these, right? And, and what do we know about composition? We know that composition is all about categories, or categories are all about composition. So we need a, we, we need a category, right? So how, what kind of category? We talked about this category before. It's, it's called the Claisley category. So we'll construct the Claisley category from these things, okay? So we are constructing a category sort of above Haskell, right? Uh, in which objects, are the same objects as we use in Haskell, types, okay? Uh, but morphisms are different. So a morphism in, uh, in this upper category, in the Claisley category, that goes from A to B, right? And, and David put it like a uh, slash across it, right? Okay, so this is like a morphism in this other category, is represented below in Haskell, as a function, pure function, from A to maybe B. Okay? So you have to like distinguish. This is a one category, this is another category. This is where we are doing the programming, this is what we are thinking in our heads. So in order for this to be a category, we have to define composition. 
right? So what does it mean, uh, composition? It means that if we have uh, composable morphisms in this category, so we have something that goes from A to B, and we have something that goes from, well, let me write it in this order, the opposite order, because this is what we like in Haskell, right? Uh, we should be able to compose them and get something that goes from A to C in this category, right? But if we look at the representatives, okay, so we have uh, something that goes from B to maybe C, and we have something that goes from A to maybe B, maybe B, and we want to get something that goes from A to maybe C, right? Okay, this is, this is very similar to what we have in uh, a, a composition, composition in, in, like, uh, in, in Haskell, right? It goes B, C, A, B, A, C. This is the operator that we call dot has this signature, right? Composition, function composition, right? And we write it in the opposite order. Okay. So if we can define this, um, we'll call this operator, it's, it's, it's called a fish or Claisley composition. So this is an operator also, infix operator, that has this um, signature. Okay. So if we can define this operator, then we can suddenly compose our fishes. We can compose Claisley arrows. So these are called Claisley arrows in this particular Claisley category. Okay? Um, can we write this? Okay, so how would we write it? Um, so let, let's, let's just implement this stuff, okay? So infix, okay? So we have some G after F. So we are composing G after F using Claisley composition, right? So how would we compose this? So, um, so, uh, so this, this is something that should return an, a function from A to maybe C. G is this, so this is our G. This is our F. And we want to do this. So let's write it as lambda A, right? Takes an argument A, okay? And uh, what can we do with A? Uh, we have to apply some, uh, we have to apply F to it, right? Because F goes from A to B. So we'll apply F to A, but the result of applying F to A is a maybe B. Okay, so we have to decompose maybe B into its two constructors, right? So we have to do pattern matching or case analysis. So we'll do case FA of, and now we have two cases, nothing and just, and just of some, let's call it B, the value B, it's of type B, right? Um, so what can we do when, when we get nothing from the first one? Then we cannot call this function g because it, it expects a b and we don't have a b. We can do nothing. Okay, well let's do nothing then. But if we have a b like this, then we can call this function g, okay? And this function g acting on b will produce what? It will produce maybe c. And this is exactly what we need. Okay? So this is our implementation of, of the fish. Yes? Huh? No, no, because g returns a maybe. Right? 
G is def defined as returning, taking a B and returning maybe C. So I don't need, it might return nothing, and it's fine, okay? So this means that the failure may, uh, may occur in two places now, right? If it occurs in this place at F, F fails, then we are not calling G and we are returning nothing. But if F doesn't fail, G might fail as well, right? And G will return nothing. Okay? Yes? So there are some cases, this, this all makes sense. Uh, there are some cases when you're building a system and you'd like to say the result was nothing and it was because of failure at step A, B, or C. Okay. Uh, it's like if you want to propagate the error, right? Where does that error come from? Yeah. Yeah. We have a way to do that with like the, the log string uh, monad that David showed yesterday. No, this is what we, 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 can, we can do this with, with either, okay? So instead of maybe, maybe has this nothing or just, right? But you can do an either string or A instead of maybe A. And then when you have an error, you return left with a string saying, I failed because of blah, 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 right? Okay? That there, yeah, and, and there is a more sophisticated system in which you can accumulate errors and so on. There is something called an exception um, that works like this, but it's more sophisticated. And there is try-catch and so on. So this is something that's used to, to, to in other languages, this is called exceptions. Uh, although a, a lot of languages now introduce this, this type as optional option or something like that because that's extremely useful and and it prevents horrible errors right okay so um, so we have if we uh, since we can define this operator we can now compose Kleisley arrows right this composition interestingly happens to be associative great Right? I mean, you can, you can check this. Uh, we, we need one more thing to, to make it a category. We need uh, identity, right? So an identity is a Kleisley arrow that goes from A back to A, right? Uh, so it will be represented as, um, I don't know what we should call it, ID uh, maybe. It should have a signature from A to maybe A. And we will implement it. We could, we could try different things, right? But, but it turns out that if we want this to be really an identity <laughs> with respect to the fish operator, right? The only option is just A. Okay, so it does nothing to, to A, it just like encapsulate in, in, a, in just, right? So it's not failing, identity is n no failure, it's always correct, and it always returns uh, the value that, that w <coughs> was put in it, yes? A to maybe A is a functor between two different categories other than the endo functor. So what am I missing? Okay, so the endo functor that, that we were talking about is this. This is the endo functor. Okay? This is a Kleisley arrow, which is a morphism. Is the endo functor on center or is the of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but now, okay, so... Uh, Will this work for any endo functor? Well, it will work for any endo functor. We'll create this, this kind of Kleisley category as long as this endo functor supports these two things, the, the fish operator and, and this kind of ID thing, okay? So, plus the laws, of, of course. Like, I mean, the, there is the uh, identity law that has to be satisfied. It's like proving that this is an identity, right? So 
we can immediately write the definition of a monad in Haskell. Okay? A monad class, well, it has to be a functor, right? Functor M. So as long as M is a functor, we can say it's a monad M where and we have to provide these two things. The fish, uh, left. There's also right fish. It's kind of more uh, useful. So just, ah, uh, no, no, <laughs> OK. <laughs> I, have to, I have to write it. OK, B to M, C, right? A to M, B, and a to M, C, OK? So I replaced maybe with M, OK? So any endofunctor that supports this and supports this identity. So this identity is traditionally called return, OK? Return has this signature, A to M, A, OK? So now you can see that maybe is indeed a monad. Right, I can say instance monad maybe where and then I can say, you know, F left fish G or G I said G F equals and now uh, this implementation here. Okay, goes here. I cannot cut and paste, but if I could, you know. And then return A. It's just A. All right? So this is indeed a monad. Yes? Um, so you are saying you define a monad as something that has these two functions. Yes. But, uh, like our definition of monad was a little bit different, and we saw that any monad in the original sense gives rise to a classic category. Of right, right. So I, th I thought this is an easier way to introduce a monad, but we'll get to bind and we'll get to join. Yeah. Um, so why, why the, this is a very nice definition because the laws are immediately obvious, because the laws of this are just the laws of the Claisley category. So you can write associativity of the, of the fish easily, right? Put parents here and put parents there. That has to be equal. Uh, there is identity with return, you know, return fish f is the same as f, and fi f fish return is the same as f, right? So these laws are, are like immediately obvious what you have to do, right? In other formulation of the Mona, uh, it's a little bit more involved. Okay, so. But this is not the definition of the monad that you will see in Haskell. Okay? Why not? Um, uh, the, the, the reason is simple. Uh, I mean, we could use this definition and, and it would be fine. And actually, the fish operator is defined in Haskell. Uh, but um, if, we, if we had lots of Claisley arrows around and we are composing them, it would be fine. Right? Uh, but this would be, you know, the equivalent of using point free notation. It's like if you were using only composition, right? Only this dot in your regular programming. That's called point free, even though this is a point, right? But this is like a different point. Uh, <laughs> I know it's confusing. So a point free notation was when you use this point, um, but not the other point. So uh, a point-free notation is kind of hard to read sometimes. It's, it's cute. It's like very terse and, and beautiful. Some people just love it. It's like these are short puns, um, little puzzles, you know. So with, with the fish operator, a Claisley composition, we would write code that looks more or less like point-free. Uh, I don't know, maybe we should call fish-free or something like that, right? <laughs> Um, but instead, we, what we like to do is, is like 
do something partially and then assign it to some name, you know, it's like, uh, okay, so a fish returns something of this type uh, that's, the, the, that's the monadic type and we would like to store it, give it a name, and then once we have this, we would like to apply something else to it and so on. So, so we want to split, so like do dissect the fish and, and get like the, in, uh, the internals of a fish, okay? The guts of the fish. So, uh, um, so, um, so what can we do? Um, well, for instance, we can say, uh, okay, so if we have this G uh, fish F, you know, we could say, okay, let's let's first apply. Um, like what's the what's the easiest way to do this? Um, let's first apply f, right? So so we have lambda a. Um, and we apply f to a, right? And this will give us something of 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 the type m b, right? And g goes from b to MC, okay? Uh, so we cannot apply G to this because it's hidden under M, but we could F map it, right? So we could say, well, okay, so we have FA, uh, let's F map, F map G over FA, right? But this will produce us something that's of the type M of MC, right? Too many M's, right? So, if we have too many M's, it would be nice if we had something that collapses them, right? So, if we have a function called join that collapses MMC to C, to MC, sorry, we would be fine, right? So, we could just apply this join here. to this result, and we'll collapse it, and, and we are done, okay? So this thing, join followed by fmap, uh, oh, so, so this, this gives us another definition of a monad, right? So this is one definition of a monad. There's another definition of, of a monad in which we have join instead of fish. And it's totally equivalent. Okay? So join and return. And the join and return definition corresponds to what, what we were talking mathematically. Join was, join was mu and return is eta. So replace everything that you've heard about uh, monads uh, in math. Replace mu with join, eta with return and you get Haskell. Okay? Yes? Uh, I'm wondering, so FA returns an MB? F acting on A returns MB. Yes. So, and when we do F map G, like, we can access the B? Is well, M is, M is a functor, uh -huh. right? So, F map G, right, will will take something that's of M B to M X, whatever G is returning. So if G is from B to X, right, then F map will take M B to M X. Replace X with M C, right? And you get M M C. FMAP goes under the hood, yes. That's what FMAP does, yeah. It goes under the functor. It takes the insides of the functor and modifies them, yeah. That's the intuition. Okay, so, so this is the second definition. The third definition is 
uh, and this is the, like the final definition, okay? There will be no <laughs> more definition. The, 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 the third definition is like, uh, okay, so if, if we apply this, this fish operator, we'll get something of, of the type M, let's say MA, right? And uh, we want to apply a Kleisley arrow to it. So we, if we can get something, you know, that goes from A to M, B, and it produces M, C, then we can implement both join and the Kleisley arrow. Okay? So, like, think about how would you implement a Kleisley arrow using this. Well, you would apply the function F first, right? And you would get something of type MA. Well, MB in that case, right? And then the second function, G, is, is, a, is an arrow from... So, okay, maybe I should replace this. B, C, alpha conversion on the fly, right? Okay. So, so F will return, F acting on A will return MB. Then you apply this thing, and, and this is your G, right? And you will get an MC. So you will get a function that goes from A to MC. So get, this gives you Kleisley composition, right? This function, okay, this function here is called bind. And, uh, and it's written as an infix operator. Okay? So this is the final definition of, of the monad um, that's used in, in Haskell. Okay, so let me write it down. Uh, class. <coughs> and now, we don't need a functor here. What usually happens, and uh, this is like a addition to Haskell that was introduced like a, a few years ago, uh, that the su superclass of, of monad is called applicative. But it, it's not really necessary to know that. Okay, so because we are not talking about applicants, maybe at the end, no, nah, probably not. <laughs> so um, we'll say class monad M, where, and, and we have this operator bind that goes, and now I'll do alpha renaming to make it nice, A to MB. To M, M, to M, B, yeah, okay. So this is the Kleisley arrow here, and it sort of looks like a continuation. You know, it's like you have an M A. This is a continuation. If you have an, you give you give me an A from inside of M, sort of, right? Then I can give you an M B, and that's the M B, right? And there is return as usual that goes from A to M A, right? And this is the final definition. Modulo this applicative thing. So, so you're saying that you don't need a function, I think you don't need it on top of the You think I don't need for which? For the, for the uh, Kleisley? Yeah, I think that if you have uh, like a map on objects and like, the structure of the Kleisley has to be that you can recover the functor structure. You can recover the functor structure? Yeah. You might be right, yeah, yeah. I know that f the one with join requires the functor, sure, yeah. yeah. The Kleisley, I'm not sure, yeah. But that's something worth checking. Um, this one doesn't require the functor because it is automatically a functor. Hmm, how would we implement the functor? So we need something like an fmap, okay? But the name fmap is already taken, so there is a function called, what's it called? Lift m, right? Lift m that takes a, so what, it, what does it do? It takes a function from A to B and lifts it, right, to MA to MB, right? Um, so, but it, it only works for monads, so lift M has the pr uh, precondition that M is a monad, monad, monad M double arrow, 
So this means that the, it has, M has to be of this class, right? If M is of this class monad, then we implement this. It means that in the implementation of this function, we can use uh, <coughs> these operators in return. So how would we define this? So what do we have at our disposition? We have this function f, and we have the ma. So I'll call it ma without uh, space, OK? So this is a variable that reminds me that it's of the type ma, right? So um, and the only thing I can use is, is this uh, bind, right? So I'll, and bind takes ma, right? And, and I have to bind it to an arrow that goes from A to MB. Okay, so I have to create this arrow from A to MB. I have, I have something that goes from A to B. Uh, so let me, let me create this using lambda. Lambda A goes into, and how do I create an MB? Well, I, I, can, I can act with F on A, that will give me a B, right? How do I turn B into MB? Return. Return. Cool. OK? So I have implemented lift M. And lift M has the signature of FMOP, right? Which means that it's automatically a functor. OK. So this is all beautiful, and we can start writing monadic code using bind and return and so on, except that it's kind of ugly and, and verbose. So this is why people came up with this idea of do notation. And do notation is just pure syntactic sugar that just makes it more readable and easier to write. OK? So a do notation. Um, is, is applied to, to, to monads. So you have to have a monad. So you, you're composing things inside a monad, but you don't want to explicitly write these, these operators. Um, and you see this, this, for instance, this is like a very typical thing when you are using mo uh, monads. You, you have some monadic value, then you bind it, and you have to write a lambda. OK? So instead of doing this, there is a kind of shorthand notation for this stuff. OK? We can erase this now. And let me, let me just rewrite lift m using do notation. And you see how much nicer it is. I don't know. I guess it is, right? So lift m takes function f and ma. And now I'm opening a do block. So do block means from now on I'm doing uh, monadic operations. So syntactic sugar starts now in this block. And I'm saying, uh, OK. So it looks as if I'm extracting an a from ma, OK? The left arrow. Okay, and then what do I do? I return FA. Okay, is it nicer? I don't know. Is it? Okay. <laughs> okay, and and you have to like align it. Okay, so so that it's a block, otherwise Haskell will not recognize it. Um, so, so this is this is syntactic sugar, and it is desugared exactly to take a may, implicit bind it to a lambda that takes a as an argument, right? A is an argument, and then the rest of the do block, everything below it. Here it's only one line, but I'll, I'll write you a, a more interesting example. Everything else below this is the body of the lambda. And this body of the lambda could also be multi-line. And then 
it, and they will be expanded again this way, first line and, and second line, okay? Uh, so let me write a, do I need this? I need this, okay? Um, let me write a function, uh, let's call it pair m, okay? It's a function that combines m a with m b and produces an m a pair b. Okay? This is, this is part of the lax monoidal structure, if, if you care to call it something. Pair M, so pair M takes M A, now without space, okay, this is like, okay, this, there is a space here, there's a space here, there's a space here, here it's, I'm just calling it M A, okay, uh, M A, M B, okay, and, and now we'll do the do block, okay, so the do block looks very nice because it says, okay, I have an M A, let me extract an A out of it, okay? It's not really what ha what's happening, right? I mean, it might be impossible to extract the stuff from a monad. Like the IO monad has no extraction whatsoever. But the, it looks nicely. It looks like, it looks like imperative code. It's like really powerful imperative language. Haskell is a powerful imperative language. So from MB, we can extract a B. I mean, I'm calling it a B, I could call it X, Y, you know, it's like, but hey, uh, I make it, uh, I want to make it uh, readable. And now I'm returning A comma B, okay? So return will turn this uh, non-monadic thing, it's a pair of A and B, right, into a monadic thing, so, so it will return this thing, right? So a lot of, a lot of um, do blocks have this form, you know, do something, 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 and then return something. This is why it's called return, because it looks like, you know, in an imperative function. But, but return is a function, and you can, you can put it in the middle sometimes, and it's, it's as useful, right? But usually, you, you know, when you are extracting some stuff, this is, this, this is sometimes read, A gets MA, B gets MB, okay? So, an exercise, how, how do we desugar it? Is that what you're asking? No. no. Oh, I was just, this is not a related question. I was curious if you can use the do block to write partial functions in Haskell. Or if there's... To combine partial functions. Or... Like inside the maybe monad, yeah. So, so yeah, that, that's exactly it. it when, when you do this inside the maybe monad, what, what happens is, it looks very much like code that is written straightforward, but it throws an exception in the middle. Because then, whenever something fails and returns nothing, the rest will be skipped. Because that's the bind. Bind for maybe will skip the rest. So it's like, here we throw an exception, right? And then the whole thing will return nothing. Yeah. Yeah, you can use it to, 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 to do anything. Um, so let's desugar this thing, right? So what does it mean? Uh, maybe desugaring will be different color. Yeah. Okay. So so this means that I have M A, and there's implicit bind to something that's lambda A. Okay. So this is the A. The rest of the block, this whole thing goes inside the lambda, okay? So, inside the lambda, what do we have? Well, we have MB, implicit bind, to a lambda that takes a B, okay? And the body of this lambda is the r remaining thing here, which is just one line, and it's return A, B, okay? So, this is, this is, yeah, close paren. So this is the body of this lambda A, this whole thing, 
and this is the body of the lambda b, just this thing. Okay? So if you were to write this stuff, it would be pretty complicated, right? It's really hard to read this and write this. And there's this indentation going on, something like this, formatting. This is very nice formatting, right? This. OK, so, so from now, now on, we'll, we'll, we'll be using the, the do notation. <coughs> now, I'll give you one more example of do notation. Uh, or not. <laughs> OK, um, so what is this thing used for? What are the other monads? They, they encapsulate lots of interesting effects, right? So we've seen the, the one, one of the effects using the maybe monad. We were doing uh, what in other languages called exceptions, right? Bypassing some code because something went wrong and you don't have arguments to follow, right? Um, the other thing is, and, uh, and we've, you've seen it before in mathematical notation, the list monad. The list monad, uh, this is, well, I don't know if you would call, it, call this effect, but uh, it simu simulates um, computations that might return non-deterministic results. Okay? Non-determinism, which means uh, that this computation might, might return different results every time you call it, right? But there is like a given set of possible results, right? So if you want to write it in, in, uh, in a functional language, you will use the list monad. And the Kleisley arrow for this would just return a list of results. All possible results that are possible for this particular argument, right? So I give you Tossing a coin, it will return both heads and tails in a list. Okay? So, like if you are uh, writing games, you know, it's like, oh, after the first move, what are the possible other moves? You would use a list monad. You would just say, okay, here's a function that returns the list of all possible second moves. And then the third move, you know, for every move that your opponent made, you, here's the possi all possible moves that you can make, and so on. So this, this, this sort of like grows exponentially, right? So this is, this is what bind does for a list monad. It just grows this exponential tree. Um, so we have exception, we have list. Uh, uh, and then there are side effects, okay? It's like most people can think about monads uh, as doing side effects. So side effects um, are... Uh, like read-only side effect, that would be you have a computation that has access to some read-only data. It's like an environment, right? It's like your program starts and, and uh, reads from a file some data, you know, it's a configuration file, right? And then all your functions that have access to this configuration file and they... So in other languages, it's, it's done using like a global variables. Right, global variables with the configuration, and every function can access them. But if you access something from, from the environment, this is not a pure function anymore. Right? So this is done using the uh, reader monad. The reader monad will, um, will do this for you as a pure function. Uh, the, the writer monad is the one that does the logging, right? So log. Uh, it, it just replaces the, the output of, of a function with a pair, uh, some monoid and the output, right? So that you can c c uh, compose the log. Is that general I.O.? Uh, general I.O.? Yeah. Next thing, next thing is I.O. Um, th the next thing I'm, I'm going to talk is I.O. Yeah, okay? Um, and... Uh, and then there's like the state monad. The state monad just like uh, not only has access to the state, but also can modify the state. So it can pass the modified state to the next function and so on. Uh, so if we had more time, you know, we could like implement all these things, but we, we don't. So um, you get the idea, right? 
Yes? Uh, for the state monad, every time the uh, state gets modified, would the state be copied? Or like, uh, so the question is, will the state be copied every time it's modified? So when I say modified in Haskell, it really means uh, create a new copy, right? Create a new copy with this little change. And you might think this is extremely expensive, like if I have a humongous array, right, and I'm making just one change, um, that there would be a lot of copying. Uh, however, in, in, in Haskell, we use all these persistent data structures. And these data structures are, uh, have uh, cheap modification. Because since they are not um, um, modifiable, right, then when you create a copy, you can just say, I'm not going to copy everything. I'm just put a pointer to this other one, right? So like it, I'm sharing like most of this stuff and I'm only changing one thing. You know, it's like I'm prepending to a, to a list. Am I going to c copy the whole tail? No, I'm just going to put a pointer there. And then the garbage collection will take care of collecting garbage, right? So finally, the most important thing that's like the crazy thing is I.O. Input output, like how do you do input output with pure functions? No way, right? I mean, if you have a function get char, um, is it supposed to return the same character every time you call it, right? If it were pure, that that what would happen, right? Or if you put string to the output, uh, okay, the compiler would say, well, it doesn't return any useful information. Let's just skip it, right? What's so, you know, like we don't need it, right? So let's optimize this code. Because the code that's not returning any useful value can be optimized away, right? So this was like a, the major, major problem in Haskell in the beginning. Like, how do we do input output? So the solution to this is um, a Haskell program is, is a pure function, totally pure. But what it does, it produces at the end, or actually at the beginning, because Haskell is lazy, so it's actually not doing anything until it's necessary. So it produces this I.O. action. And this I.O. action um, is, is, is a monad. Why, why is it a monad? Well, because you want to be able to compose these things, right? You, you want to be like, say, OK, my uh, my program is first asking a user, uh, printing something to the screen and asking the user and so on. I, I want to be able to compose this stuff. Okay, so because it's a it's a monad, you can a use do notation with it and you can use return. And uh, and the fact that uh, every Haskell program produces this I/O object or I/O action as it's called is reflected in, um, in the fact that it has this thing called main, okay? So every Haskell program has main. And maybe you've seen it before, right? Main has the signature IO of unit, okay? So it's an action that doesn't produce anything, just produces unit, right? Um, um, and the idea is that, you know, you write main and it produces this action and then afterwards the runtime system takes this action, treats it as a little program, which is now not pure. It actually executes it and uh, reads the stuff from the keyboards, uh, connects to the internet, the database, and all this stuff. It sort of happens after Haskell. It's like, Haskell, I'm washing my hands, you know, I'm pure, you know, you do whatever you want, right? Uh, so the simplest implementation of main that I can think of would be, well, return, right? Return unit. I can do that, right? Because it's a monad. IO is a monad, so it has return. I can return unit. This program does absolutely nothing, but it's a valid program, okay? So the next thing is, well, let's call some library function, like put str 
ln, put str ln. And what? Hello? Hello? Okay? So this is your first hello world program. Okay? And put str ln is, is something that, uh, um, that has the um, put str line has takes a string and produces an IO action of unit. So it fits perfectly, right? Because that's what we need. We need IO of unit. So put str, str line will do exactly what we need, right? And then the next program is main equals, and now we start composing because we have a monad. So we can say do, right? And now we can say put str line, um, what's your name? Right? Uh, and then the, the, the user will give us some kind of string, you know, so we say uh, get line, okay, get line returns an I.O. action with a string inside. We can never get at this string, okay? What we can do is we can bind it with the next thing, right? This, there is a hidden bind and hidden lambda, and we can use this S, pretend that, that we have it, right? And we can say put str line. And here we can say, you know, hi space plus plus S. Okay? So we'll say hi. Now notice that uh, th these two lines, they they don't have uh, the, the left arrow. This is because we are ignoring th this value. I mean, it could be written as, you know, underscore, which is a wild card, you know, but um, you don't have to. So if, if you are ignoring the result, because this is, this is done purely for, for side effects, right? This is purely to that something appears on the screen. <coughs> And also, inside a do block, the compiler is not free to rearrange these things, right? I mean, so you say, why doesn't it like first print this and then call this or, and so on, right? So uh, a lot of people think of, of a monad as uh, sequencing things, right? But uh, it really, it, the, the only sequencing that happens here is the sequencing of function calls. If you have two functions that are combined using a dot, right, one of them has to be called first because it has to provide the result so that the next one can take it as an argument, right? So dot is one way of sequencing things, right? And the other way of sequencing things is the fish operator, right? Because it has the same thing. So, and, and the bind will, will sequence the stuff. So the sequences, sequencing is hidden here behind the scenes, because there is a bind, right? And bind enforces this, okay? All right, I guess that's, uh, that's it, okay? Now go and program and get a job programming <laughs> JavaScript. Oh, no, sorry, Haskell. <laughs> Thank you.